the advice I would give in the context of the discussion that we've had is to not fear animal foods. There really is, there has, despite there being tested in huge, large, rigorous clinical trials for decades now, there has been no evidence that they cause any kind, they don't cause heart disease, they don't cause obesity, they don't cause diabetes, they're really there really is no harm to those foods and they are full of the essential nutrients and minerals that we need. So, so do not fear those foods and do not fear the fat in those foods. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrada Gore. This is episode 96, and my guest is Nina Teicholtz. Nina is a well-known speaker and the author of The Big Fat Surprise. She got her start as an investigative journalist years ago, and that's one reason we figured she was the perfect person to go to when the documentary What the Health came out. At first glance, the movie seems to be a health documentary, just as touted. But upon closer examination, it is clear that it is filled with hype and hyperbole, bent on persuading the viewer to take on a plant-based diet and eschew or leave behind animal products. Nina digs deep and shows how little scientific support there is for the claims they make throughout the movie. Whether you've seen it or not, listen to this show because Nina teaches us how to be discerning when it comes to the various health claims that we are exposed to. Before we dive into the conversation, we want to invite you to be a part of something special. First, we really want your feedback on this Wise Traditions podcast. What do you love? What do you think we could improve? What topics would you like to hear in the future? Just go to our website, westonaprice.org, and look for the podcast survey on the homepage. Secondly, we want to ask for your support for this podcast effort that has been going strong for the past year and a half or so. The foundation is a nonprofit that is member supported, and the only way to keep wise traditions on the air is with your help. We've set a goal of raising $15,000 by the end of October. If every listener, if you just gave $10, we could easily make this goal. So please be a part of keeping us on the air, and don't wait until October 31st. Look for the donate button on the westonaprice.org website and give today. Thanks in advance. Hey, and last but not least, come on out and meet us in person at the Wise Traditions Conference this November, the 10th through the 13th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There are going to be tons of new speakers, lots of topics covered, including hormone health, weight loss, and the GAPS diet. Sally is giving a master's cooking class. You're going to love it. So register today and take your health to new heights at wisetraditions.org. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Nina. Hi, great to be here. I am so eager to have you on the show because every time I turn around, someone is talking about that new documentary that was released called What the Health. And I'm thinking, what the heck? (laughs) Because (laughs) I've heard a lot of hype and hyperbole from the movie. I was eating with a friend when she said, hold on, Hilda, one egg a day is worth five cigarettes. And I was like, what is she talking about? Tell us, where is this movie coming from? What's up with all this? Well, you know, I don't know the exact origins of the film, but I can tell you that the people who are in it are a group of vegan diet doctors. A few of them, Neil Barnard, Dr. Greger, uh, are passionate animal welfare advocates. So I think their motivations really stem out of the animal welfare movement. And the others are well-known diet doctors, um, vegan diet doctors, And I think the objective of their film is to scare the bejesus out of everybody who might eat any kind of animal foods, you know, eggs, any kind of dairy, meat, of course. And I think the film is successful in that way. It is a terrifying film to watch. I mean, they just hit you at every possible angle, the health angle, the animal welfare angle, the just horrible pictures of animals with awful things being done to them. And I mean, it's, it's a really successful piece of propaganda. <laughs> that yeah. film. 
I saw that you said, and I haven't seen the movie myself, so I'm, I'm curious about this, but you said even the way it's filmed, the techniques they used in dimly lit rooms where they conduct interviews, the way they put it together is bent on frightening people. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a film expert, but you know, when I was watching the film, I was just overwhelmed by this sense of dread and foreboding that suffuses the whole film, like this lurking danger in the foods we thought were healthy and the way that the lighting is very dark and there's all these pictures of the filmmaker, the narrator who's driving through dark tunnels and or pictures of him alone in his room at night with a single light bulb over his head coming across, you know, dreadful facts. And you just feel like he, the whole, the whole, feeling of the movie is one where like this intrepid journalist, although he's not a journalist, but it feels like he's investigating and discovering this underworld of unknown information. And it's, it's terrifying. It fills you with fear. It fills me with fear, even though I know that, you know, I knew even beforehand that that 99% of the facts were wrong. And, and I checked all the facts. And so then I found out that indeed 99.9% of the facts are wrong. Well, that's exactly why we wanted to have this conversation with you today, because we want to get to the facts. People can take almost any information and twist it or present it in such a way that you feel compelled to change. And I actually believe this movie is very effective in convincing people to leave meat and animal products behind, isn't it? I think so. I mean, I think, as I said, it's a very effective film. I think it's a piece of propaganda, but I don't, it's not an honest film, but it's an effective film. So let's begin with what you said a moment ago. The, the guy who's in it is not a journalist? He is not. He's a, he's a vegan filmmaker who, his last movie was called Cowspiracy, which alleges that cows are the main reason for global warming, which I think is an opinion that is very unsettled science is maybe the nicest thing you can say about that. But that was also a very scary movie. And so he came into this film, he says his, that he's objective and he just wants to find out what a healthy diet is, and lo and behold, it leads him straight to the, to, you know, the only people he interviews are the vegan diet doctors. So, I mean, it's a very, it's contrived, this idea that he's actually searching for the truth. And, you know, he doesn't act at all like a journalist, I mean, largely because he isn't one, but that does lead to some funny moments in the film where, say, he asks the security guard at, say, the American Diabetes Association, you know, why do you have recipes on meat when meat gives you diabetes? And this is, so this is something he's asserting in the film and he's asking the security guard at the front desk and the security guard is like, well, I don't know. I'm just the security guard. You know, I mean, if you're a journalist, you know, you need to call the media relations department and ask them to put you in touch with the appropriate expert to talk to. But, you know, here he is talking to the security guard and his conclusion is, is, you know, see yet again, I'm, I'm, I'm denied the truth and nobody will talk to me. So, Oh my gosh. From a journalistic perspective, it's amusing. But, um, but you know, again, effective filmmaking. Nobody will talk to him because they're hired to be the security guard and not to be a health expert. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that does sound like very contrived. And for the undiscerning viewer, they would just be like, oh, yeah, they're not answering his question. But the discerning viewer would think, wait, are they really trying to get at the heart of the matter. So let's us get to the heart of the matter right now. Let's look at some of the health claims they make in terms of the big picture, because I understand you've done an analysis and have evaluated 37 health claims that they make. Is that right? Yes. I went through every single one of their health claims, and I and I looked at the evidence, the studies that they provide on their website to support each of those claims. And I, I looked at each one of those studies or blog posts or whatever it was to see what, what, how do they support their claims. So, and my background for doing this is I spent almost a decade researching a book called, called The Big Fat Surprise for which I really learned how to be a very rigorous and exacting consumer of science, which is to say, you know, you need, if you're going to make a health claim, you need to, science has to be replicated, it has to be based on randomized controlled clinical trials. I mean, there's just a number of criteria and, and kind of a hierarchy of evidence that you need in order to be able to say, this, this may be true, this is likely to be true. So we don't have time on this show, Nina, to go through all 37. I will point people to your PDF and your post in the show notes. But let's 
look at the big picture, talk to us about the epidemiology that will maybe take us in a different direction than this movie. Yeah, and you know, this is um, for those who advocate for plant-based diets. This is sort of at the heart of the issue, which is that they have um, very few, almost no, randomized controlled clinical trials. That's the kind of science that you do when you actually feed people and you divide them into groups and you randomize them. And there's a whole series of reasons that we won't go into here, but that is the only way that you can demonstrate cause and effect. Right, you can that you could demonstrate that say a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, has an effect on preventing diabetes or preventing obesity or whatever it is, mm-hmm. some outcome. You must have a randomized controlled clinical trial to make that kind of claim. So the vegan and the plant-based folks do not have those trials. What they have are a few tiny, tiny trials um, that they routinely cite, but they you know, they have one trial by Dean Ornish on 40-something men that may or may not show what he claims it shows. They have, you know, a couple of other small trials that do not show any benefits from plant-based diets, despite the fact that they were conducted by vegan diet doctors. So they had every bias and, and you know, going into the study trying to find a benefit from the diet that they favor. So that body of rigorous evidence is tiny to non-existent. Uh-huh. Um, So what they do instead is they quote what is called epidemiological studies, also known as observational studies, and those are studies that often involve large numbers of people where they follow tens of thousands of people over, you know, ideally over decades. And they, every once in a while, maybe every six months, maybe once a year, they send them a questionnaire and they say, what did you eat in the last six months? What did you eat in the last year? You know, how many peaches? How many prunes? How much of this? How much of that? Mm. Well. These studies are inherently unreliable for many reasons, starting with the fact that, you know, who can remember what they ate yesterday, much less quantify really what they ate in the last six months, so that they, and when they try to, sh- to, to test whether or not those food frequency questionnaires are accurate, they find that they really just are not. They're very inaccurate. People lie about what they eat, they exaggerate, they don't remember. So that's one, you know, one of the main reasons those studies are unreliable. And then another one is that there are all kinds of things that they can't measure that affect health. They don't really, they can't measure really, like, how, how good of a social network do you have? How much stress do you have in your life? How much, you know, I mean, all of these things impact health, and they can't really measure those things accurately. And they can't adjust for them because they don't really know how much those impact health. Ultimately, in the end, these are the kinds of studies that can only show an association, right? Mm -hmm. An association between two things is not causation. If there's a strong association, the way there was between heavy smoking and lung cancer, then you're like, well, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's enough. That was a, that was a 35 times greater risk from heavy smokers getting lung cancer compared to non-smokers, right? 10 to 35 times more. Right. The kinds of associations that we see in these studies cited by the vegan diet doctors is 1.2, 1.3, 1. Like tiny, tiny. They're so low, and you know the field itself has. You know, there's a kind of a standard in the field that any time that number is less than four or five, it is really not something you can consider consider rigorous. It's it's just sort of noise. Um, where it's not even something that you should, you know, you could, there's just too many what's called confounding factors to have a number like 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 to be at all trustworthy. In other words, if if I'm a vegan, but I also do yoga, and I also live near the beach, you know, these factors, these other two factors may be affecting my health more than my diet. That's what you're saying. There's all these variables. And the fact that people are just anecdotally saying, well, I ate this, I ate that, we can't really know for sure, right? So these things are not pointing to the fact that it's not persuasive scientific evidence that a vegan diet is better for you. It really just, it really just isn't. And, you know, I mean, and, you know, to take the flip side of you, the, the vegan doing yoga, living by the beach, having no stress in your life, um, compare that to the who, you know, who eats a lot of red meat over the last 30 years, pretty much 
the people who ignore everything their doctor tells them to because, you know, these are the people who are like probably also guzzling beer and, you know, doing a lot of unhealthy behaviors and are probably not, you know, probably not even going to their doctor regularly or taking their medication or whatever. So I think that, you know, it's, it's very possible that red meat eating is associated with a lot of unhealthy behaviors that you can never properly really adjust for. So, so you know, we're not taking yeah. into account, I'm thinking of the recent statement from the World Health Organization that eating meat can be carcinogenic. They were also looking at regular meat from a conventional store. They weren't comparing hormone-free and antibiotic-free meat that's sustainably raised. So that's, there's so much more to the package, isn't there? There is. There just is. And there have been a couple of attempts to actually take epidemiological findings and nutrition and to see well, which of them have proven when they've actually been then tested in rigorous clinical trials, which of them actually turn out, how often are they actually correct, right? How often yeah. are these epidemiological findings proven correct? It turned out that the range was zero to 20% of the time. So that means 80 to 100% of the time they're wrong. Um, and like, so that means, you know, so 37 health claims, you know, and they're all, they're, almost all the evidence they cite is epidemiological. So, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a chance that one of those is, you know, possibly correct. Who knows? So it really is just, it's not the kind of science that provides reliable outcomes um, for, you know, for any kind of health recommendations to the public. It just aren't. And as I said, when they then went and did randomized controlled clinical trials in the couple of instances where they took a group of people, I think it was about 80 in one case and 100 in another case, these are both randomized controlled clinical trials, the more rigorous kind of science, and they conducted by vegan diet doctors who really wanted to find a benefit from a vegan diet, they did not see any benefit of that diet over the standard American diet that it was compared to. Well, now I want to talk to you a little bit less about science and more about experience. I understand there was a woman in that movie who at the beginning is like, oh, I'm arthritic, I need to get a hip replacement. And apparently by the end of the movie, she's like, two weeks later on this plant-based diet, I'm amazing. It's like she threw her little crutches away and was ready to go. Like, is that people's experience? Talk to me about that. Well, that's, uh, when I saw that little anecdote, I was, um, I found it not credible because she said in two weeks, not only was she, you know, she first appears barely able to walk and in two weeks she's striding down the street and she says, and I'm off all my medications. Well, the first alarm bell that went off in my head about sort of the trustworthiness of that is what doctor just throws away all your jettisons all your medications um, overnight like that. Like I know people who have reversed their diabetes through diet and have, you know, have lowered their blood pressure. And, but, you know, it's a very gradual process by which doctors will kind of titrate down your medications or, um, you know, they don't just throw out 10 medications overnight. So that seemed to me pretty implausible. And then I had an actor friend of mine, a, a, a filmmaker who's in acting community he said um well according to him he says she the, her techniques of method acting were were completely apparent to him <laughs> as an actor observer but you know I, I don't i really don't know but it seems implausible to me that that any responsible doctor would just take somebody off all their medications in two weeks but i do think tell me if you agree with this people who try to eschew meat that's conventional will feel better if they get off of that because there are antibiotics, there are hormones, there's soy and corn in these livestock's diet that is affecting our health. So they may feel a, feel a temporary boost, I guess is what I would say. But eventually, as we both know, animal products are needed for health and happiness. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I, certainly, if you maybe switch from conventional to uh, conventional products of any kind to really high quality products, and people might experience some greater sense of well being. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's really been studied, but you're not going to re recover from your diabetes and, and get off your blood pressure medication and whatever else was ailing this and her arthritis medication. I mean, she was just ailing on every level. I don't think that happens within two weeks. I, 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 th I'm, I just, I think I know enough about, I know somebody who's conducting a 
trial on diabetic patients. And, you know, it, it takes a few months and you titrate down your medication. So I don't know, to me, it just didn't ring. It didn't really ring true. Um, that kind of mir- but everybody loves a miracle story. So again, it's a very effective take technique or or in a in a movie to have a story that's just so in- wildly encouraging. Coming up in the second half of the program, Nina exposes more flaws in the claims of the What the Health documentary. Hey, and a quick word just now from the Weston A. Price Foundation. They are holding their wonderful Wise Traditions Conference this November, the 10th through the 13th. I'm going to be there. Sally Fallon Morell is going to be there. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, Kim Schutte, a whole plethora of speakers who have fantastic information to give you. And there are some unique one-day opportunities that you'll want to be a part of. Sally is giving a master's cooking class on Monday. She's also doing a one-day seminar on Saturday. Those within driving distance of Minneapolis, you've got to find a way to make it there. Take your health to new heights and join us. Go to wisetraditions.org and register today. And secondly, we want to hear from you. You are listeners and we love you, but we want to hear more specifics about what you love about the show, what needs a little tweaking, and how we can make it even better. So go look for the podcast survey. It is on the wisetraditions.org homepage and tell us what you think. Also, we are looking to raise funds to help keep the show going. We have set the goal of $15,000 by the end of October 31st. Could you just give $10 to keep us on the air? It's so simple. Go to the donate button also on the Weston A. Price.org website homepage and give today. And thank you so much in advance. I think it's good for us to have some healthy skepticism here, which leads me to these vegan doctors that you keep talking about who are behind the movie. If their motivation is pure and they really believe this is the best diet, then that's one thing. But what other factors could be influencing their getting this word out that people should issue meat and animal products? So this is a complex subject that involves, I think, um, a, a whole lot of issues that I've observed. I mean, in some cases, these are these are people who are motivated by animal welfare concerns. So Neil Barnard is, is really he started really started out as an animal welfare activist and came to the vegan diet and promoting that diet as a way to promote his other agenda. Um, I think Michael Greger is the same. He served um, worked for a long time for the Humane Society. And I want to say, I mean, I think those are perfectly uh, legitimate passions to have, but you know, if it turns out as it seems to that human genuine good human health depends upon the nutrients and minerals that we find in animal foods in their most abundant and, and bioavailable forms, then we can't just eliminate those foods and expect to be healthy. So I think that also, you know, many of these doctors really do have kind of empires. You know, there's a there's a whole empire, there's a franchise that is related to Dean Ornish. He go out, he licenses his programs and is reimbursed by Medicare. And so is the Blue Zones guy. He's got a whole empire, a business empire. So many of them have these huge business empires that they oversee. Um, they certainly have their own passionate followings that they need to feed. And then there's been some interesting recent investigative work done by um, by a doctor in Tasmania who's discovered that there's a, a whole element of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which has been funding a lot of these. The Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that its participants um, should shun animal foods, and they, they, they definitely shun meat. They're, they've been they've been espousing the belief that meat causes cancer since the late 1800s. And so they have been funding a number of these groups, um, a physician group that promote plant-based diets. So there may even be this kind of religious element. And in fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they have a university called Loma Linda University. And um, some of the biggest studies on vegans and vegetarians come out of that university. It's one of the bigger, what we one of these epidemiological studies that many of these vegan doctors cite. Um, they've been heavily cited in the literature. Oh, interesting. So I'm just processing all that. They have a real vested interest in the outcome because whether it's religion or diet, people have built their business kind of on this. 
premise. Yes. And I mean, imagine if it's your religion. I mean, imagine if sort of it's like saying going to the Catholic Church, if the Catholic Church had a diet or, or you know, or the mm-hmm. Jewish faith. And you say, we'd like, we're, you know, please tell they, they, you know, they have a deep interest in promoting their, the, their, their sort of religious precepts. Um, so there are all kinds of interests that have nothing to do with the actual diet itself. Although, you know, I don't want to deny the fact that some people do feel very healthy on a vegan diet. And, and I, I have no doubt that some of these vegan diet doctors are among them. Um, it, may, it does seem to work for some people with supplements. It's important to say that that is not a standalone diet. It's a diet that requires that you take external supplements. Um, B12 is really the main one, but maybe also iron and folate, which are not so bioavailable in plant foods. So it is it is possible, I think, that people thrive on that diet, but I think it is harder to thrive on that diet. And the reason that I take offense more than anything for a film like that, other than pr- promoting the like the 99% untruth that they they're they're promoting, is just that I don't see any reason why we should all have to eat their diet. Um, it seems to me that people do the literature, scientific literature, really supports this idea that that there is a there's a diversity of people, and we thrive on a diversity of diets. And so people ought to be allowed to choose the diet that really that they that works best for them. Science really shows the majority of people thrive and have thrived historically on on diets with animal foods in them. Well, I was going to say I love hearing this from you because I was thinking. What if someone accused Nina of trying to build her own big fat empire <laughs> um, herself? What would you say to someone who uh, would say that to you? Well, you know, I don't, in my book, my book is not a diet book and I don't promote a diet. I have never promoted a diet. I've always said to me, the literature shows that diets that are higher in fat and lower in carbohydrates work extremely well for people with metabolic diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Um, and for those people, um, it's a diet that ought to be uh, not demonized, not called a fad dangerous diet because it's been studied rigorously in many, many, many clinical trials now. That diet ought to be available to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if you're a healthy, lean person, you know, like my son, do I... I eat bread. <laughs> I eat less of it because, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman. But, but I, you know, I think that there, there ought to be a diversity of diets. And one of the things that I've been speaking out about more and more is just that, you know, what I find lamentable is that our government and also these vegan diet doctors are saying, you know, there has to be one diet for everyone. You know, there should not, we, we should not say, the science doesn't support saying that there's only one diet for everyone. That's, that's just not the case. Mm-hmm. So, Well, and I love that you have put your journalistic hat on both in the work you did for your book and in analyzing this movie, What the Health. Are there any final comments you want to bring to folks who are listening right now who maybe just wonder where can they get more of the facts or the studies that really are more reliable about our diet and it's linked to our good health? What the health post that I did is on dietdoctor.com and they asked me to do that. And, and, I, and if you do take a look at that, I, I urge you to just, when you look at the evidence base that I created, I would just do a, find a search for um, trial, controlled trial, and, and take a look at, because that's the rigorous evidence, right? The randomized controlled trials. Take a look at those trials that have been these famous trials, um, that, is, that are so often espoused by Dean Ornish and Caldwell Ethelston at the Cleveland Clinic and, and just see what they actually say because I think that's interesting. There's um, on my website, which is ninateichels.com, there's a post on Dean Ornish, which I think is interesting for people to read on about what exactly is the quality of the science of his diet that he promotes. You know, if you're looking for overall evidence base um, on, on, you know, what are healthy diets, I, I, it's hard to send you to one site right now. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I, you know, I, I do have a post also on the DASH diet on my blog. It was a blog that I did. And, one, and I, you kind of hit, hit a sore spot with me because one of the things I really, really want to do is to really have a database like that. Like, well, what is the evidence for each one of these diets? 
it's much different than what we think. One place you can go also is this article that I wrote for the BMJ, which is also available. You can link to it. It's on, listed on my website because that really evaluates the evidence base behind our dietary guidelines. And you can see how little evidence there actually is for the government's so-called gold standard advice um, and, and, and all the evidence that's been ignored. Um, and I think that's a pretty interesting read. It's hard hitting. And I know, again, within your post on Diet Doctor, you go through claim after claim of the What the Health movie, just returning to that real quick, uh, you know, that meat causes cancer, that one serving of processed meat will increase your risk of diabetes. And then you respond with your analysis and studies that, re- you know, have something to say that may be in contrast with what they were presenting, right? I love that. I think that's what you have to do in this field because there's so much, um, and I think it's why, you know, it took me almost a decade to write my book or why this is such a hard field because the claims and counterclaims, you know, they fly back and forth so wildly and I think people like, they just don't know what to think. Like this study or that study or anybody can quote a study. Yeah. And what you have to do is you have to, you really have to drill down and say, okay, here is the universe of studies. And here is every, I'm going to analyze every single one of them. Like you have to be a complete obsessive compulsive kind of personality, which seems to be um, me. (laughs) 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 But like you do have to go after every last thing because you want to show like this is the totality of the evidence. You need to be able to say that. You go through in that PDF the health claims they make and the exact support for those health claims. So people can drill down to see where is this coming from and how strong is that support? That's right. I do. And you can feel free to be, um, to go through that. And it, you know, I think it's interesting, but it's interesting to see, uh, it might be tedious. I don't know, but I think it's interesting to see the paucity of the actual evidence that they have. Yeah. It's kind of like if you're going to go buy a beach house and you think it all looks great. And then if you look really closely, some of the posts have termites and you're like, oh, no, you didn't know at first glance because it looked good from a distance. But when you drill down, you see the truth about whether or not you should live there. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good analogy. It's like going to the reference section of a book and saying like, oh, my God, all these pages are blank. (laughs) (laughs) It's not really there. Right. Well, I'm going to close with a question I ask my guests at the end. If a listener could only do one thing, Nina, if they could only do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? The advice I would give in the context of the discussion that we've had is to not fear animal foods. There really is, there has, despite there being tested in huge, large, rigorous clinical trials for decades now. There has been no evidence that they cause any kind. They don't cause heart disease. They don't cause obesity. They don't cause diabetes. There really there really is no harm to those foods, and they are full of the essential nutrients and minerals that we need. So, so do not fear those foods and do not fear the fat in those foods. Thank you for your time today. And I'm really <laughs> glad you addressed this really popular documentary. I can't wait for people to listen to this episode. You're the best, Nina. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to talk to you. My guest today was Nina Teicholz. For more on Nina, visit TheBigFatSurprise.com. For links to her PDF, which goes into detail about this movie that we've been discussing today, and for other resources that we mentioned on this episode, simply go to the WestonAPrice.org website, go to the podcast page, and click on the show notes for episode 96. Hey, and a big thank you to Podcast Village, Sarah, Charlie, Georgia. We love you. Thank you for all the support you've given for this show in particular. You guys, they are experts in training podcasters and promoting and producing shows. Check them out at podcastvillage.com. Last but not least, remember that we are always open to your feedback and for connecting with us. Just follow Weston A. Price on Twitter or Instagram at Weston A. Price and look for me at Holistic Hilda on Twitter and at Holistic underscore Hilda on Instagram. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening today. Our website, WestonAPrice.org, offers free resources to address your questions and support your journey to health. You'll find videos, articles, and brochures covering a broad variety of health topics. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming and the Healing Arts. 
The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.